Welcome to the Linen Hall Library and thank you for joining us today and I hope the talk proves of some interest. Can I say from the outset that if anyone thinks as a result of my accent I'm hostile to Con O'Neill, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm a staunch Con enthusiast and believe he was very badly treated by the English and Scots and if it had been necessary he's the kind of person I would have crowdfunded today. In his honour I've turned out more or less all in green although it has been 40 shades. And I would like to say a special guten tag to my friend Gunther, who said he will be listening in Germany. If you stroll through the galleries of the Ulster Museum, you will encounter this unprepossessing and ungainly singular block of sandstone in the form of a seat. It has been in the possession of the museum since 1897, when it was acquired by the institution's original guise of the Belfast Museum in College Square North. It was taken to Botanic Gardens during the museum's relocation in 1929 and was displayed in 1939 as the state chair of the O'Neills of Clannaboy, which was exhibit number 88 in an exhibition reflecting the history of Old Belfast. Despite the fact that it offers no personal gravitas or regal dignity, it does bear a plaque which claims the late medieval chiefs of the O'Neills of Clannaboy were inaugurated on this chair at Castle Ray. Sadly, there is not the slightest shred of evidence to support this claim. It is the invention of a late 19th century group of dedicated Gaelic enthusiasts desperately in search of surviving historical artifacts. We can all agree that the chair was contemporary with the 16th century O'Neills and that Conn and his family and others will have sat upon it, but it served no inaugural or coronation purpose. Although there is no documentary reference to the chair's existence until as late as 1832, the stone seat was rescued from its lonely ignominy around 1755, in or close to the former castle of Castle Ray, which was once home to some of the O'Neill clan of Upper Clandy Boy, who had once been the Gaelic masters of 224 townlands in North Down and the Ards. In simple terms, the Clandy Boy O'Neills controlled, although that's slightly deceptive, Upper Clandy Boy and its neighbour across Girlfast Lock, Lower Clandy Boy, that is generally County Antrim. The summit of power probably lay in the hands of Brian McPhelim O'Neill between 1556 and the Earl of Essex's murder of him in 1574. The genealogy you have before you is a very simplified one of the O'Neills of Upper Clandy Boy, and the individuals referred to in the text today are highlighted in red, Sir Brian being the uppermost. He occupied Belfast Castle, which is shown here um, on the map of 1685, um, the central avenue uh, was the Belfast River, now culverted over as High Street. You have at the left-hand side the original Corporation Church, now St George's, and at the far end, um, the castle, the brick castle built by Sir Arthur Chichester, um, which stands, stood between what is now Corn Market and Donegal Place. A somewhat more, more basic map of about 1570 also states that Brian was master at Castle Ray, the grey castle on the hills overlooking the town. Um, this map shows Belfast Lock coming in from the right, the uppermost place mentioned is Belfast, and in the lower corner, although not particularly legible, it indicates Castle Ray or the Grey Castle, uh, with Sir Brian McFeelin O'Neill's name written there. With the mania inspired by the arrival of the stone chair at Belfast Museum in 1897, Gaelic enthusiasts wax lyrical in creating a mythology about it. A Dr. Fraser wrote of Castle Ray, where the O'Neills of Clandy Boy had their principal abode and stronghold, and where successive chieftains were duly installed by their clan in full view of the assembled and assenting people. Castle Ray was not the principal stronghold, that was Belfast, and there is no documentary or other evidence for any inaugurations at the site, but other, others plagiarized the notion. Seton Milligan, uh, who was the father of Alice Milligan, to be featured um, by Jason Burke later this week, echoed that it stood, that is, the chair stood for centuries on the hill at Castle Ray, where the stronghold and residence of the O'Neills of Clannaboy was situated and their chieftain inaugurated. There have been various claims for the antiquity of the castle, but its active existence was probably as short as 70 years. It appears to have been constructed in the first half of the 16th century possibly as a consequence of rivalries within the Clandy Boy O'Neills. The antiquary, Bishop William Reeves, suggested that the first occupant may have been Brian Fagatark O'Neill, 
who ruled Clandy Boy from 1537 to 48. But the first documentary evidence of the castle's existence is as late as 1553, when it was written uh, by the Lord Chancellor of Ireland. Excavations as late as the 1980s indicated that it was not a very robust structure, and it was captured by the English forces with considerable ease on a couple of occasions, including the 6th of July by Sir Arthur Chichester based at Carrick Fergus. The Ordnance Survey memoirs of the 1830s do indicate that it had been of a substantial size. This Bartlett map um, by Elizabeth's cartographer, Robert Bartlett, um, shows Belfast left centre, Carrick Fergus to the north, and just below Belfast on the hill of Castle Ray, you have the castle um, indicated as of a substantial size. It was in fact, as the Ordnance Survey memoirs say, 100 feet square, which was effectively 10 times the ground space of either Audley's Castle or Kilcleaf Castles. It was, however, abandoned by around 1608 when the last Gaelic Lord of Castle Ray, Con O'Neill, sold it to Sir Moses Hill. There now remain no signs of the building. When JW, local artist J.W. Carey strolled up the hill to make a drawing of the site in 1895, he merely featured the line of an old outer wall. By the 1930s, an orange hall had been constructed on the site and it later became a showroom for Belmont carpets and is now a nursery school. There are hints that much of the stone may have been cannibalized for the construction of the original Castlereagh Presbyterian Church in 1650, and other loads were allegedly quarried for the building of nearby Leatham Cottage, built in 18, 1786 and said to be the oldest inhabited building in Belfast. Castlereagh, that is the Grey Castle, was built of grey or greyish North Down sandstone, either from Scrabo or more probably in this instance, from the shore at Cultural. The chair cannot have predated the 16th century structure, and one expert on the subject of Gaelic royal inauguration, Elizabeth Fitzpatrick, has written that the chair was pulled from the ground as a singular piece of stone, and the most probable source is a thick sandstone bed within the Craigavad sandstone exposed on the shore at Cultural, less than 10 kilometers to the north of Castle Ray. The chair will have been retained as an item of furniture for what was most probably a poorly furnished home, which offered little domestic appeal or comfort to any of its occupants, who will at some stage have included Elis Neil, Con's wife, their children, his brothers and others. But if Con's residence at Castle Ray offered little appeal, his 224 townlands were a totally different matter. In the late 12th century, John de Courcy and his Normans had constructed five modern Bailey castles in the locality, Hollywood, Ballymacken, Dundonald, Beaver and Knock, and papal taxes were levied upon many local churches, all of which is evidence of a prosperous and populated district. And so it continued down the years. And one local historian has written, from 1570 until the Scots settlement about 35 years later, hungry eyes were turned to County Down. The area's fertility, economic potential and charm, grossly underestimated by the O'Neills themselves, proved a magnet for the mendacious, marauding, piratical Scots and English. Brian O'Neill had been knighted in 1567 for his loyalty to the crown and was confirmed in his lands. But some of the latter were duplicitously granted four years later to Elizabeth's Secretary of State, Sir Thomas Smith. He dispatched his son to lay claim to the lands in County Down and Brian, Sir Brian obtained the support of the Earl of Essex, who then in turn equally betrayed him at Belfast Castle in 1574, and he took O'Neill and his family to Dublin to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Such utterly dishonorable behavior by the English does much to explain the cantankerous, unreliable response of the O'Neills in subsequent years. After the butchering of Sir Brian, the English tended to promote the effectively puppet rule of a cousin, Nile. Um, this is a very simplified genealogy of the O'Neills of Upper Clandy Boy. Those mentioned today are highlighted in red, with Sir Brian being the uppermost. The English tended to promote the effective um, puppet rule of a cousin, Nile, who's mentioned on the left. But one of his more aggressive uncles, uh, purposeful uncles, Con McNiloge, who's mentioned on the right, escaped from Dublin and managed to gain control of the area. 
He even got himself knighted by the English and in 1587 was, according to the documents, confirmed in his lands from Belfast to within a few miles of Portaferry. And his death on the 7th of April 1589 in Castlereagh is one of the few datable events associated with the locality. Clearly sensing a lack of independence on the part of Nile, the O'Neills then elected his son Con, who's mentioned on the left again, as ruler of Upper Clandy Boy, based at Castle Ray. He was selected by the law of Tanistry, by which members of the O'Neill clan favoured the individual they believed would most worthily represent and lead them. And in retrospect, it must be wondered what qualities and talents were ever discerned in the unconvincing, rather pathetic last Gaelic lord of Upper Clandy Boy. It is not to be wondered that Con and his supporters became embroiled in the wider O'Neill resistance in the Nine Years' War, up to 1603, against the Crown. Con's constant vacillation between loyalty and rebellion matched the character of the English, but he too proved to be an indifferent and casual leader in every capacity. I've indicated that the economic potential of County Down was the lodestone for cross-channel adventurers. Yet one of the most mysterious aspects of the last third of a century of Celtic rule in Upper Clandy Boy was the inability of the O'Neills to exploit their own 224 fertile townlands, which were assessed at no less than £12,000 a year. When in November 1605, Con's lands were divided between himself, retaining the smallest part, and Hugh Montgomery and James Hamilton, the latter alone is said to have received no less than 15,000 acres of arable land, 1,000 acres of pasture, 10,000 acres of woodland and 2,000 acres of heath and moorland. Yet only five years earlier, Arthur in 1600, Arthur Chichester, the governor at Carrickfergus, had said of Nile that he was a beggar who yesterday being with us was not able to eat without the Queen's entertainment. And likewise, before his final arrest in 1603, his son Con, despite this vast expanse of land, was clearly reliant upon a crown pension. In the first two years of the 17th century, Con was incarcerated briefly in Carrickfergus Castle on a couple of occasions. Chichester clearly found him irritating and untrustworthy, but evidently decided that Con was a small ripple in a large O'Neill Sea in which there were more dangerous fish to net. It was at this point that others began to take advantage of his lack of reliability and political acumen. And Con's eventual downfall was finally escalated by something more mundane than political principle, alcohol. At the close of 1602, or early 1603, Con sent some men into Belfast to replenish his wine store at Castle Ray. This appears to have resulted in an argument with English soldiers in the town, and his men returned empty-handed. Con sent them back, and in a further melee, an English soldier was killed. The authorities, probably, probably totally frustrated by the Irish chieftain, did not react hastily. They took some days to assess if they could manipulate the situation to their advantage, and arrested him a week later on a charge of levying insurrection against the Queen, essentially treason, and returned him to Carrickfergus. It is at this point that the story of Con O'Neill, Lord of Castle Ray and Upper Clandy Boy, becomes clouded by what nowadays would be referred to as fake news. That is, deliberate myth, fiction and untruths, compounded by historical inaccuracy and, un uh, and carelessness, which in fact has prevailed to the present day. The long-awaited and much-praised Dictionary of Irish Biography was published in 2009, and its entry for Con O'Neill suggests that he sought the wine to celebrate the death of Queen Elizabeth, but he had in fact been incarcerated some weeks before her death. It continues by erroneously claiming that he sent his men to Carrickfergus to purchase the wine, not Belfast, and when he sent them back there, it says, Con and his friends took up a position on the hill to watch the spectacle. The compiler of Con's entry, who actually wrote 228 entries in the dictionary, has evidently never examined the topography, as even as the crow flies, it's at least 10 miles from Castlereagh to the Norman castle, and therefore probably invisible. The significant intervention then came from the Scottish Montgomery family, who traded for some time at Carrickfergus, and cannot have been unaware of the, uh, cons of, uh, the frustration that Con presented to the authorities and his own parlous position. 
They later composed the tale in the Montgomery manuscripts in which they deliberately misrepresented events. They were to claim that they actually rescued Conn from incarceration by getting his wife, Elish Nineo, to smuggle in an escape rope inside two cheeses. This fiction contains no conviction whatsoever. The reality is that the Montgomerys had had their eye on the valuable estates of vulnerable Conn for a very long time. And despite suggesting otherwise that they'd actually rescued him, they indeed kidnapped him and took him to Scotland. Around this time, Queen Elizabeth was succeeded by the Scottish King, James VI, now James I of England, which gave the Montgomerys obviously much greater leverage at court. And they claimed they could help Conn, including obtaining a, a pardon for him, but probably with a mixture of alcohol and threats, insisted that in return, he had to sign over at least half his lands. And when they all went to the Royal Court in London for confirmation, another more influential Scottish family, the Hamiltons, was able to insist that they receive a substantial share of the Clandy Boy property. The tripartite agreement between Conn, the Hamiltons and the Montgomerys was signed significantly on the 6th of November, 1605, the very day after the discovery of the gunpowder plot when everyone at court was focused on more important matters. The Montgomery manuscripts claim that Conn then returned in triumph to Castle Ray, but historians generally agree that this is a myth. He'd been absent from his lands, offering no leadership for well over two years, and his tenants now realized that they had to tolerate English and Scots settlers on what was their land. In his history of the town of Belfast, George Benn was to suggest that Conn lived at Castle Ray, and if he'd been wise and prudent, might have continued to live there and transmitted his estates to his descendants. Conn, however, could not adapt to the new world order. Left with only 60 townlands, Conn seems to become prey to indifference and despair and began selling off his remaining lands to raise money. Castle Ray was purchased in 1608 by Sir Moses Hill, who seems to have made a brief attempt to shore up the outside. It was, however, very quickly abandoned and fell into disrepair, and all that was left of any worth was a stone chair, which at one third of a ton was probably too problematic to remove. If his wife and children continued to live with him, Conn condemned them to a miserable itinerant existence. In 1609, he was to be found at Ballyregan, Dundonald. In 1613, he was at Ballyhanwood, where he suffered the indignity of losing his horse. And in 1615, he was at Tully Carnet. It is claimed that he died, probably a sad disappointment to his Gaelic subjects, his family, his clan, and himself, in Hollywood in 1618 or 19, and was buried at Ballymacken off what is now the old Hollywood Road. This um, map shows what, uh, on the left-hand side, what is now the old Hollywood Road, with um, Gardnerville, which is now Garnerville, and to the south, Mot Moat House, with Ballymacken, uh, uh, the old uh, Mot of Ballymacken, which is allegedly where Con was buried. If the stone seat at Castle Ray had been an intrinsic artifact of Gaelic inauguration, the O'Neills actually manifested precious little attachment to it. The fact that it lay abandoned in the Castle Ray Hills for a century and a half is a significant indication that it lacked any pride or symbolism for the Gaelic rulers. Following the fiasco at Kinsale in 1601, any authority which the O'Neills had managed to retain started to evaporate. And in August 1602, Mount Joy, the Lord Deputy of Ireland, emphasized their downfall by deliberately destroying their most celebrated ceremonial site, used as late as recently as the 1590s, in particular, the stone inauguration chair at Tullacog near Cookstown. It would therefore be reasonable to assume that the clan would consequently be anxious to preserve a similar location at Castle Ray, and that the English authorities would be equally purposeful in destroying it. There is, in reality, no com contemporary historical reference to any inauguration or coronation furniture in the hills. In endeavouring to assert their arrival in County Down in 1571, and especially after the assassination of Sir Brian in 1574, and following the arrest of the irritatingly unreliable Con O'Neill by Chichester in 1603, one might have expected that the English authorities might have proved deliberately disrespectful for any such meaningful token at a, a, a location, Castle Ray, which was as recently as 1601 acknowledged as a place of importance for the country. The sources, however, detail no such occurrence. 
Likewise, one might have expected some reference to any residual item of Gaelic authority when Con's most able son, Daniel, returned to Ireland in 1635 in an effort to reclaim his territorial inheritance, which had long since been dispersed amongst the Montgomery's, Hamilton's, Hills and others. Daniel was to achieve no success in this pursuit, and there is no evidence that he made any nostalgic visit to the area of his birth, although he may well have smiled at the irony that despite the poverty of his upbringing, he was now rumored to be one of our, uh, England's wealthiest men. During the attempt to restore Gaelic power in Ireland in 1641, it also might have been expected that a sacred symbolic site at Castle Ray might have become a focus of resistance. But again, silence reigns. And in the aftermath, the Franciscan Edmund Makana made his courageous tour of counties Antrim and Down in 1643 and 44 but he did not find the location tempting enough to visit. A century later, in 1744, Walter Harris did visit the castle, but saw no compulsion to identify the random artifact in his volume on his history of County Down. And as late as 1817, Henry Joy indicated that there were some remains of the castle still visible on the hill, but despite the fact that he claims it was the residence of Con O'Neill, whose authority was akin to that of a king, he makes no equation with a stone seat, which he himself by that time regularly passed in the Belfast marketplace. After 150 years of abandonment, the stone chair was salvaged from its lonely vigil on the hill. It was taken to the town centre sometime around 1755 by Stuart Banks, who between 1755 and 78 was to be sovereign of Belfast on seven occasions. Whilst he's acknowledged as the salvation of the chair, it is important to recognize that he had no emotional or cultural attachment to it. He viewed it merely as a potential item of furniture. Banks was highly respected and appreciated as a merchant, burgess and sovereign of Belfast, of whom it was said upon his death in April 1802, none was ever carried to the grave with a more sincere regret. And William Drennan's sister, Martha McTeer, who lived down here, just close to where the Linen Hall Library now stands, reported that a long train of carriages have just gone to the grave with Stuart Banks. Banks's interest in the stone relic may have been piqued by the fact that his principal address was Castle Street, probably very close to where Fountain Street now runs, close to the site of the original castle in Belfast, and also because his sister's father-in-law, Isaac McCartney, had written a contemporary account of the fire which destroyed Chichester's rebuilt castle on the 25th of April, 1708. Banks, in fact, discerned no, uh, displayed no discernible interest in Belfast's past and was, in fact, the complete antithesis of Con's personality and everything that the latter may have stood for. Banks' ancestors took full advantage of the commercial exploitation offered by the Scottish settlement and his undoubted commercial acumen was a direct contrast to Con's enduring insolvency as was his disciplinarian character to Con's more casual demeanor. Banks demonstrated complete loyalty to the Crown, unlike the O'Neills. He had written to the authorities in Dublin that I always think it is my indispensable duty to render every service in my power to the support the best of kings and the best constitution on earth. And when there were threats to Belfast from overseas, as there had been under the O'Neills, he raised one of the best volunteer companies in the town at his own expense, and as sovereign, did much to promote law and order. The first unequivocal reference to the existence of the stone chair was an article published by George Petrie, claimed as the father of Irish archeology, span in late December, 1832, in the D Dublin Penny Journal, which he had founded that year. Petrie had obtained the information of the seat from the father of the future historian of Belfast, George Benn who had sketched it and conveniently imagined its historic value. But even Petrie conceded in 1828 that respecting the chair's antiquity, we have nothing to offer beyond conjecture. Ben's extensive footnote said that it was found in the mid 1750s amongst the ruins of Castle Ray by Stuart Banks, sovereign of Belfast, and built into the wall of the butter market or weighhouse at the lower end of Waring Street, which in the 18th century stretched as far as Tomb Street. In other words, we've got Waring Street on the left of this view. Originally, it stretched right across the present junction towards Tomb Street. 
Shannon Millen, later responsible for laying the, laying the chair, uh, displaying the chair in the Ulster Museum exhibition of 1939, claimed that Banks had moved the artifact as clerk of the markets by virtue of his office sovereign and had built it into the wall of the butter market situate at the southwest corner of Tomb Street as a resting place for the weary vendor of goods. In other words, it will have been visible where nowadays you swing around the one-way system at the Albert clock, probably close to where the rubbish bin is. In 1829, when the butter market required enlargement or repair, the seat was left amongst the rubble and would probably have been broken up until it was rescued from the detritus by a local bricklayer come builder, Thomas Fitzmorris, who placed it in his rear garden in Lancaster Street, just south of the Belfast Charitable Institute. George Benn, who was born in 1801, would himself seen the chair when it was on public display in Belfast and indicated that it did attract some populist interest at this time. Then in 1832, Ben added, it attracted the attention of a Dublin gentleman of archeological good tastes who purchased it and had it removed to his country seat at Rath Carrick in County Sligo. In 1828, Petrie had formed a close friendship with a Dublin barrister, Roger Chambers Walker of Rath Carrick, described in the Dictionary of Irish Biography as a passionate collector of Irish antiquities, spending considerable sums on metal, stone and textile antiquities from all over the country. For example, the Coronation, Street, uh, Street, sorry, the coronation Stone of the O'Neills of Clandyboy, County Down, was carted with great difficulty in 1832 from Castle Ray near Belfast to the Garden of Rath Carrick. The latter point reflects the occasional careless research undertaken into the chair's history, as it was, of course, actually transported from the centre of Belfast. Determined at this early stage of Irish archaeological investigation to flaunt all the artefacts he could unearth and promote, Petrie concluded that it was for a long period the chair on which the O'Neills of Castle Ray were inaugurated. To considerable astonishment, in 1851, three years before his death, Walker suddenly sold his collection to the fourth Duke of Northumberland in Alnick. But probably because of its substantial weight, the O'Neill chair was not included in the sale. And in 1897, it was eventually sold by his son, John Francis William Walker, to the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society. On this occasion, it arrived by train and was housed in the Belfast Museum at College Square North. It appears to have been purchased, somewhat improbably, by, in retrospect, by the recent Lord Mayor, Sir William McCammond, who died a few months later on the 2nd of March, 1898. McCammond, acclaimed as a citizen of broad and generous views, was one of a substantial group of primarily Protestant Gaelic enthusiasts determined to promote Celtic revivalism. Bereft of contemporary and meaningful artifacts, the stone chair was, of course, a godsend for them. Extravagant claims were made for it without even the flimsiest evidence. Seaton Milligan argued, we have no record of the making of this chair, but that it was made, and for the specific purpose of inauguration, there can be no question, an assertion which is pure fantasy. Despite the seat's essentially unstable and basic shape, as late as 1939, at the time of the Ulster Museum Old Belfast exhibition, the curator, of, uh, the curator Shannon Millen, asserted, rather amusingly, that the chair can claim superiority in the form of construction. In fairness, some of the Celtic fan base was a little more cautious, and one anonymous member of the Belfast Naturalist Field Club designated upon its arrival in November 1897 to compose an article for public consumption in the Belfast newsletter, stated that this inaugural chair may have belonged to the ancient chiefs of the district, which they subsequently ruled. Others were more brash, provocative, and imaginative. The central figure in the reassemblage of Celtic history and culture was Francis Joseph Bigger, the seventh son of a seventh son and an unapologetic fantasist, who according to the Dictionary of Biography, saw his role as the promoter of all things Irish. One commentator suggested that in his dreams, Bigger was the O'Neill, returned from a remote past. For Bigger, the arrival of the stone was the equivalent of cultural manna from heaven. His Antrim Road home was transformed into a Gaelic enclave to which all the enraptured enthusiasts flocked, including Father James O'Laverty, the historian of County Down, and Sir Roger Casement, who is said to have admitted, as he countenanced his fate at Pentonville Prison in 1916, that his fondest memories were of visits to the Antrim Road. 
Around 1880, when the house was occupied by Bigger's father's cousin, it was named Ardville. By 1884, it came into the possession of Bigger's father, Joseph Bigger, who shortly afterwards renamed it Ardree, probably in honour of his wife's maiden name, Ardree. And then when Bigger occupied it with his mother, he took advantage of the euphony of the name to change it to the Irish Ardree, the High King. For all the initial unbounded rapture about the seat, there are indications that the wild enthusiasm ultimately faded, as it was effectively the only major surviving artifact from a Gaelic past and an unconvincing one at that, the gloss, or perhaps in this case the mat, appears to have faded. And in a fesh shrift of Bigger's articles produced the year after his death, it receives only one unenthusiastic transient mention. One of the principal figures of the Gaelic League and enthusiast of the Celtic revival who frequented Bigger's home was Cahill O'Byrne, whose entry in the Dictionary of Irish Biography boasted that he can be seen at, as at once the summation of, and a lament for, the northern branch of the Irish revival. And he was as anxious as any of his colleagues to retain the relics of a brutalized native history. It has been argued that his most celebrated work, as I roved out, first published in 46, was punctuated by expressions of anger against the whole heritage of the Ulster plantation. Of his 128 articles in the volume, he retails the belief of many people that the stone seat was once situated in the butter market was the coronation stone of the O'Neills. Yet even the fixated O'Byrne eventually concluded that in all our reading, we have failed to find any traditional authority for that statement. Thank you for listening and if anybody has any comments, um, additional information, uh, would like to get in touch, I'm sure the Lynn Hall Library will filter them to me. Thank you.